Hi, I'm Talia Newland. Welcome to Happiness Hints. We have today another holiday special. Today I'll be talking to Ray Hatherton. You might remember that I talked to her some time ago, but today we're going to talk specifically about Ray's battle with cancer. So Ray, the first thing I want to ask you is, is it possible to be happy while you have cancer? Since the, it, happiness in cancer sounds like a juxtaposition, it sounds like direct opposites. It's like, how could you possibly bring those th two things together? And, um, uh, but I seem to be doing that. <laughs> uh, I had um, an operation two years ago. I went in for, a, I'm not going to get into the real details, but basically I had a huge tumor on my kidney that was completely enveloping my my kidney and um, had I come three weeks later it would have been too late so I actually came at a very very appropriate time and um, by the time they operated which was three weeks later I, it was actually doubled in size so Ow. it was it was out to get me Ooh. and um, and I could have viewed it that way but I thought it was actually pretty timely and pretty fortunate that I first of all I fell in love with my doctor <laughs> um, which is the necessary part of this process, by the way. I think it's very necessary to be in love with your doctor. So they removed the kidney and uh, and some other stuff that was around it. And, you know, I took some painkillers for a few days and then experimented with pain a little bit, which was very interesting. And uh, then I just, you know, recovered and got on with my life, basically. Last fall, I was doing tests about every four months, and last fall, uh, it had metastasized to my lungs. Now, this is not a cancer that metastasizes to your lungs, so it was very unusual. And um, my doctors were kind of freaked out, and um, I was pretty freaked out, but freaked out in a very um, hands-off kind of way. I think my family and friends were more freaked out than I was. Um, they wanted to do trials and treatments and all of these things and I took a look at all of those things and I did a deep examination of each one and came to the conclusion that probably my body couldn't handle it. Couldn't handle um, it. <clears throat> you mean couldn't handle the treatments? couldn't handle the treatments, mainly because I've almost never even taken an aspirin mm. in my mm. life. So, so, are you, so are you talking about chemotherapy and um, that kind uh, of stuff? They, for the kind of cancer I have, they can't do chemotherapy. Okay. So what sort of treatments were they um, suggesting? Um, a, a very nasty drug that I would have to take for the rest of my life. Right. That would be debilitating on all levels. Yeah. Yeah. Mental, physical, the whole thing. Ouch. Uh, either that or I could do this trial where I could take a chance on taking that drug or another new drug that had all kinds of its own side effects. And <laughs> and I looked at my history and actually the oncology nurse looked at it with me and said, I think you're right. I, I don't think you could do this. <laughs> right. Yeah. So I elected to do cannabis. Okay. Um, which was great <laughs> um, <laughs> um, it's legal in Canada and um, but you have to really ramp up into a level that is quite overwhelming um, and I had a very good time doing that <laughs> <laughs> this is all pretty intense stuff so yeah. and you're saying that you're doing pretty well in terms of happiness yeah. So what kind of happiness are we talking about here? Putting aside the marijuana, which you were taking for pain, I assume. Yeah. No, I was taking it to kill the cancer. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, yeah. All right. I was doing dosages that were beyond anything they'd ever done before. It's interesting. And it worked. And, and yeah. it worked. Okay. So well, we'll get back to the effects of the marijuana and stuff, but what kind of happiness are we talking about here? I didn't buy into the fear. Of course, there's plenty of it around you mm. when you're going through this kind of thing because your family goes berserk. Mm. And um, as much as they try to stay 
grounded, they actually get to be higher maintenance than um, you would imagine because their fear shows up even if yours doesn't. I stayed level. Mm. And it was interesting because when you asked me to do this, I, I, pulled, I, I, I got on my Facebook that day and there was a memory uh, thing that shows up on Facebook and, and it was about a commentary by Pema Chodron. And uh, it was just so appropriate. And it says, if you're a good horseback rider, which I am, mm -hmm. your mind can wander, but you don't fall off your horse. In the same way, whatever circumstances you encounter, if you are well trained in meditation, you don't get swept away by emotions. Mm -hmm. Instead, they perk you up and your awareness increases. Great, great. Yeah. And that really says it that all. says it all, yeah. Because yeah. as much craziness as I had around me, my doctor, my new doctor, my new oncologist, was actually pretty stunned at how I handled all of this. So you, we're really talking about equanimity. I guess so. I mean, I, that's probably a word that I hadn't thought to use, but I would say that's true, yes. Yeah, this evenness that you're talking about, you're not caught up in the hope and the fear and all of that. No. So, so it's like your basic level of happiness, if we want to call it happiness just remains yeah okay that's great there are some things that i do that provide structure for me that i think are really crucial and vital especially considering the environment that i've had to set up for myself so i did a lot of homework mm -hmm. i i looked at the allopathic levels i looked at the alternative levels and i'm now doing i'm working with a doctor in boston and um, it's quantum physics, basically. I kind of assign myself to brainwash myself, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, and also to maintain my boundaries. I was very clear about who I wanted around and who I didn't want around. Mm -hmm. The other thing is I don't use the C word a lot because I find that, mm -hmm. first of all, we're programmed to think in a certain way when you hear that word. Yes. And it's a very damaging way to think. Yep. And um, <clears throat> it's not that we have any choice about it. We don't. Mm. We're, I mean, it's, it's in the ethers. So doing my homework, maintaining my boundaries, brainwashing myself, and structure. Every day, <laughs> I have a little two-hour ritual that I do in the morning that involves breathing and meditation and practice and exercise and you know all of these little things that I have all hooked together that are essential to me much more so than normal it isn't that I didn't do meditation or I didn't do practice or anything else but now <laughs> it's much more serious you know it's like okay like I don't not do it just because I don't feel like it. But one of the things that I do, for example, in the morning is um, I play loud music and I dance. So that's part of what I do. Great. And, and I move <laughs> and I just shake out the cobwebs and <laughs> um, turn up the music loud and move. Okay, so Ray, please go through for our listeners, go through the the things that you actually do that they could do to help them maintain a sense of well, evenness. Yeah, one of the things that I don't do, first of all, to not answer your question, <laughs> is I don't read newspapers, I don't have TV, I don't watch the news, I don't listen to the radio, mm. except CBC specific things that I want to listen to that are pre-programmed. I don't... Um, <laughs> listen to my friends suggestions I may peruse them but I don't listen to the demands and suggestions and you have to do this and you have to go there and you <laughs> that kind of thing is yeah. like they have the best suggestions in the world and because I'm a naturopathic doctor I don't know these things all of a sudden <laughs> anyway it's pretty interesting so so every morning when I get up I try to move slowly 
um, which is unlike my character. I'm a type A personality. I am driven beyond belief. <laughs> and um, so slowing down my walking, my pace, and everything that I don't do normally. So, so when I get up in the morning, if I feel like getting up, I get up. If I've had a rough night, I don't get up. If I feel like sleeping an extra hour, I do. Mm -hmm. And um, then when I do get up, you know, I run my bath, I put on the kettle, and I sit. When you say sit, you mean sitting in, in meditation? Then I do um, a Merkaba meditation that is um, sacred geometry, visualization, and deep, very deep, powerful breathing that has a visual that goes with it that is described and in front of me on the computer. And then I do uh, Qigong and a special type of ball work for my feet and a lot of tapping. So a lot of body tapping on different points. And then I take my hot water and I sit in the bathtub for another however long I feel like sitting in the bathtub. And I do salt and soda baths. So I have essential oils and I have a cup of sea salt and a cup of baking soda in my bath every day. Sorry, can I just say, this is what you've worked out that nurtures yourself for you. If you were advising other people with cancer, what advice would you give them? Because presumably they need to find their own rituals and support. Yes? They do. And I think, and, and people that have families or relationships or, you know, I mean, it's a different conversation, right? Mm. But there are some things that are important, like some of the supplements I take and the salt and soda baths with essential oils, I think are pretty crucial. Mm. Because they detox and they rest you. Um, staying in bed as long as you can, I think, is vital. Mm. So if you need to stay in bed, you stay in bed. Yeah. And if you can't possibly stay in bed, then you nap. But it's about maintaining mental peace mm. Mm. because your body can't heal without that, I don't think. Yeah, yeah. If you're in constant mental turmoil or anxiety or worry or yeah. all of that, I mean, that, in my experience, can't possibly contribute yeah. to healing. Yeah. So meditation is crucial. It's not just meditation. It's about... it's. It's about taking meditation into every single thing that you do, mm -hmm. about presencing it, and about stopping when you catch yourself going, blah, 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 mm. or starting to multitask, mm. or starting, and multitasking is the killer. Mm. It is deadly. One thing at a time, one activity at a time, you know, even me, I have to watch myself getting up, turning on the bath, coming out and plugging. You know, it's like all of those things. I have to slow down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Even when I'm walking down the street, I have to slow down. You know, everything has got to be much more experiential, much more in the present, yeah. you still get angry. Yeah. You still get frustrated. Mm. You still get pissed off yes. that you've got this damn thing. Yeah. You know? Mm. I mean, it's not like you can not acknowledge that because mm. it's there. Mm. Building a network of support is crucial. When some people think of, you know, having a sort of a 24 7 happiness, they find it hard to imagine how negative emotions such as anger and stuff have a role have a part in that so could you kind of explain how you work with these emotions that arise because I mean as you said it's not ignoring them you have to acknowledge them but how can you do that and not have this this evenness knocked away how can well, you maintain it and still experience all those things I frame my ranting 
<laughs> so I'll call up my girlfriend who's a therapist and say, I need your ear for 20 minutes. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. And she'll say yes, or she'll say no, but you can call me back in 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. And I'll call her and I'll say, you know, and this, this jerk and this, you know, and just literally, you know, talk about all my frustrations and who's pissing me off and what, you know, it's like all of those things. And then when I'm done, I'm done. Yeah, because it's, it's, it's the going over and over things that's the killer, isn't it? It drives me crazy and I won't I won't treat people that actually do that I'll just say okay we're gonna stop now and if you don't stop it's over mm. Mm. you know mm. you don't get to do that with me mm. you get to say it the way it is with all the emotion that's there and that's it mm. and then you move on and then you move on yeah so yeah. you don't rehash it and rehash it and rehash it you give it up yeah yeah do you find that when you, um, you know, when you're doing your rant, do you have a, a strong awareness that you're doing it? Do you find that you can sort of, you, that part of you is, is watching yourself have that rant? Totally. Mm. Totally. But I also have a really healthy sense of humor. Yeah. Yeah. So, because I, <laughs> I find myself sometimes, you know, I'll have a rant and then I'll just crack up laughing. <laughs> <laughs> because it's like, oh, I've just had such a great rant. You know, that was so good. <laughs> so even though I might, you know, there's anger there. It's it's not, um, I don't take it seriously, I guess. No. Yeah, I see no. that in you too. Mm. Yeah, no, I don't take my anger seriously. Mm -hmm. I realize it's a necessary part of me. Yeah. And and this process brings it up in spades. Yeah. It also brings up grief. Yes. It also brings up, you know, all kinds of emotion that uh, that I've suppressed, yeah. uh, that I've ignored, mm. that I, uh, you know, I mean, you, you pull this the the little tiny string of grief, and it just goes on and on and on, and connects to everything that you've ever lost. Writing is really useful, but everybody says, "Yo, you have to journal everything." I don't. Mm. I write when I want to write, yeah. and I don't want to don't. Yeah. You know? Mm. Mm. And I don't make myself do anything mm. nowadays. Mm. If I don't want to go someplace, I don't go. That, to me, sounds like you're nurturing yourself. Yes. If I feel resentful about seeing somebody, I don't see them. This is the mindfulness you're talking about. That's why you're slowing down so you can see all of these things and, and act appropriately and nurture yourself. Yeah. Well, you, you hit the nail on the head. The slowing down part, mm. I think, is what I have avoided mm. most of the time. Mm. And so, because then you do see all the things you don't want to see. I've kept everything at such an incredible high pace that mm. I never had time to see anything. When I talked to you before, you said cancer was the best thing that had ever happened to you. Is this what you mean? Yeah. The funny thing is, I've always been in debt, and now I have nothing other than what's in this apartment. That's it. And But I have no debt. And that has been huge. And I realized how all the spinning was costing me. Ray, can we go back to the um, marijuana trial? Um, I was actually in a, a cannabis office the other day with a medical doctor who addressed my client and said, well, you know they're curing, I, she said, I'm not supposed to say this, but you know they're curing cancer with cannabis. And I said, yeah, I know, because I did it for six months and it, it stabilized my cancer. The medical community is using it to mitigate symptoms, which it's incredibly successful at doing. You know, stops nausea, you feel good, you um, can eat well, all of those things. Uh, pain, it's great for people with Parkinson's and seizures and getting rid of brain cancer with it. So you have to do levels that the normal everyday doctor would be horrified at. I was doing a gram a day of THC, straight THC. What sort of form did you take it in? It's an oil and you basically ingest it. 
you have to work up very slowly to that level. Mm. If you if you took that level right off the bat, it probably would kill you, <laughs> right. or at least or at least take you into some other place that you probably couldn't handle. Yeah. So yeah. you have to ease yep. yourself into it. It takes months to do that. Yeah. But um, then 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 you can see it working. Um, in terms of your um, story, as the path of your cancer, uh, where are you at with it now? Well, that's another conversation altogether. I'm doing work with this doctor in Boston who's actually much better recognized in Europe than he is in the States. It's basically a box that delivers a quantum frequency to your hypothalamus, which controls... His, his theory is that it's not a chemical problem. It's a bioelectrical problem. And so impinged nerves on the spine and impinged nerves, the vagus nerves, which are the biggest nerve set centers in the body, and the phrenic nerve, are the things that are being impinged that are causing cancer, because it, it's cutting off the oxygen to the organs associated. It's a combination of twin na, acupuncture, um, this little box, and a type of tapping, and uh, seems to be working. Okay. The cancer is actually retreating, or is it just... Stabilized. Right now, I'm at. I've declared myself stable. How do you feel about dying? Uh, I wish I had a lot more time to practice. <laughs> um, but we really don't know when we're going to die. I, I mean, I say to my patients and clients, "Where's your guarantee?" Mm. Because we don't. I mean, the people that died today, more than half of them didn't know they were going to go. Mm. They went in car accidents, they went in landslides, they went in, you know, I mean, they went in a thousand different ways, right? Mm -hmm. So life's a terminal disease. I think that comes back to the first thing that you said, and that was that there's not a lot of fear and hope. Mm. And I don't mean hope in the way of possibility, mm. but the grasping kind of hope, mm. you know? Mm -hmm. And... Um, because there isn't that there, and because I am so committed to contribution, of course I'm going to make sure that everything's set up so that everybody has a good time and they don't have to plan all of my <laughs> eulogy and all the rest of that stuff. Here, read it. Mm. You know, it's mm. like, that's what I want said. Mm. That's, this is the music I want. No, I don't want a funeral. Yes, I do want my ashes spread in Australia. Yeah. You know what's yeah, like? yeah. So, Ray, what I'm seeing here is um, a real acceptance of death, not, a, not as a, even as a possibility, but as a definite end result, whether it's from the cancer or whether it's in 20 years' time. Um, have you got any sort of advice or any pointers that you can give to people so that they might be able to see their death in a less fearsome way? There are a couple of games out there now. One's called Bucket List. <laughs> yes. And the other one's called Exit. And I think approaching it with humor mm. is a really good idea. Mm. I guess what I see very much with you is this sense of humor. And um, you have established this evenness in your life where you, you don't get thrown around by the things that um, come up in your life, whether it's um, anger, whether it's cancer, whether it's death. How do people develop this sort of quality? If you're, if you're leaning in the Buddhist direction, I would say, you know, find yourself a good Vajrayana teacher and set aside all your, your story about what they're supposed to be like and just do it. But... Um, <laughs> That's, you know, that's my approach. Mm -hmm. um, as far as, I, I think it's important to have a network of people around you that are like what we call a sangha, a, a group of people that are in the same mindset that mm -hmm. support where you are. Mm -hmm. And I think that is pretty crucial. Mm -hmm. So if we step outside the Buddhist thing, you're talking about finding a spiritual teacher? Of some some kind, yeah, yeah, and um, and be pretty discerning about 
who that is. Yeah. yeah. And um, there's a really great book out right now called um, The Guru Drinks Bourbon. Mm-hmm. And it's mostly about choosing a Buddhist teacher, but it also talks about if you're not going to do that, um, be clear about what you are choosing. Yeah, I think, I think it's crucial to find someone outside of yourself that no matter the circumstances can see what you can't and that can give you some direction about what to do about that. So if you're a Christian, yes, where would you be looking? Well, I was a Christian. I was a very devout Christian. And I did find teachers along the way that I did trust and that were clear mm. and that did direct me and give me support. So I think it is important to find someone that you can really trust. Mm. Um, okay, well, I think we'll end it there, Ray. So thank you very much for your time. My pleasure. <laughs> Anytime, Talia. Okay. The kind of equanimity that Ray has does of course come from meditation because in meditation that's exactly what you're practicing. You're practicing sitting there and letting whatever rises rise and then letting it go again and of course that helps you to handle anything that comes up in your life with equanimity so it doesn't bother you and in that way though you might be physically in pain though you may be having physical hurdles you don't have to suffer over your suffering. I know that when I started meditating, it made a huge difference to my ability to handle whatever rose in my life and therefore my general level of happiness. And to help you bring meditation into your life, I've made an MP3 of a guided meditation, which you can pick up for free at talianewland.com slash guided dash meditation. And also check out my bookshop, at talienewland.com, look out for the book called How to Meditate Easily, Effectively and Deeply, because that will help you, no matter whether you're a beginning meditator or a more advanced meditator. I hope you enjoyed this happiness hint. Of course, there are plenty more that you can watch and more are coming every week. If you did enjoy it, please subscribe to the channel. And please don't forget to like the video and share it around because that really does help the videos to get to the people who really need them. Thanks a lot. See you next time. Bye.